Good morning, Rock Church, Facebook family and friends. This is Pastor Robert Louis Stevenson. I want to say good morning to all of you all this morning. Um, let's just go ahead and pray. Father God, we come this morning in the name of Jesus with heavy hearts, painful hearts. God, we pray that uh, you heal this land. You heal your people. God, we need a word from you. We need to know, God, that you are, you are present with us. Father, I pray, God, that even as I uh, have uh, just felt so many different emotions, and uh, you know what they are, and I'm sure my brothers and sisters are feeling their emotions. But God, we need your guidance like never before. Holy Spirit, we need you to to do only what you can do to bring comfort like never before. Jesus, we ask that you will send upon your peace that will surpass his understanding. God, I pray that as you will uh, be uh, the speaker in and through me, that all the people, God, that will hear this and see this, God, they will begin to mend these, some of those emotions they may be feeling themselves. So God, we are thankful and grateful that you have given us your word that helps us to process. We pray this in Jesus' name, that God's people say amen. Amen. I'm so glad that each and every one of you all are on right now. Uh, this is going to be what I believe uh, uh, a special, special message this morning. Uh, I know every week is, but I want to uh, really be a help for each and every one of you all, for what you may be feeling, given where we are at, uh, and not just this pandemic, but where we are at as a country, even as the uh, city of Chicago. Um, so my brothers and sisters, I want you to hold tight. I got some things to share this morning. I got a message I believe that God has given to me, uh, first for me and now for you all, and then share with those who you love and know. Uh, we're still talking about faith. Listen, guys. We've been talking about faith for a reason. Now you see why. We've been talking about being contentment. Contentment. Now you see why. We understand what discontentment will do. Um, last week we talked about uh, why faith is necessary. Wednesday we talked about that because life as you and I know it can change at a drop of a dime or a drop of a word. And now we see a drop of a murder. Yes, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The murder of George Ford. Uh, and, and we understand even the 400 years of racism that we have endured. The truth of the matter is, <laughs> we're still going through a pandemic too. Now, I am telling you all something, man, that uh, uh, I've wrestled with for the last past month or so. I just hadn't been talking about it. But I've wrestled with it. Uh, I've seen it. I read it. Uh, I've read it, um, and I know it's real, but some of the things I've wrestled with, knowing that some of the injustice that we face uh, here in Chicago, here in America, is real. You can't cover that up, right? You can't cover that up. Rock Church was founded upon racial reconciliation, and so uh, I am delighted, Bridget and I are delighted to be leading an amazing congregation that is diverse. We have diversity in our church in the inner city in the community of Austin. And I know that some of my friends have never ever uh, joined or may never ever have visited us on a Sunday morning. So you wouldn't know. Then I have friends that have come to, to visit on a Sunday morning and was like, wow, where these white folks come from? They had no idea how diverse our church is. And so I thank God for my brothers and sisters, my white brothers and sisters who we have grown to love. Man, I am telling you, I salute them who live in our community, who not only live in the community, have been serving our community for over 30 some years and been serving our church and, and loving the people of Austin. They are actually Austin nice. I know members of our, of our church who are Caucasian brothers and sisters have moved their family in to the Austin community. And I am telling you, man, God is amazing. But I still have a word. I still have a word. And, and I can tell you, uh, without a reasonable doubt in my life, in my heart, 
I am still struggling. I am struggling with the fact that racism are real in America. Racism is real. Listen, oftentimes, I don't even tell people this. I, I, when I go and play golf, sometimes I be the only black man on the golf course. And let me tell you something, I get all kind of looks and, you know, and, and just the way it, golf is a gentleman's game. There's time I'm in my golf cart and I wave at some other white folks out there. They won't even wave back at me. Won't even say good morning when I address them good morning. I know what that feel like, y'all. I know what racism in, in America feel like. I know what it, the downplay, I know what the mannerisms look like. But yet... <laughs> I am called to a standard, man. I know who I am. And I know who I belong to. But the reality is for real. And I want to share. I'm going to get, I'm going to get vulnerable, vulnerable with you guys this, this morning. Right? I just need you to be with me. I need you to be praying right now for me. Yeah, I, I want you to be praying because even though there are some things you may be struggling with, I'm going to help you through this through God's word this morning. But some of the things that I, you may not be aware of that I've been, I, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely been on my heart. Like some of the past events, you know, over the last month and, 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 and a few days, even 48 hours, like there was a FedEx driver who going about his business, delivering a package to a resident house. And, and, and the, the, the resident, your husband thought that this FedEx driver wanted to break in his house. Although he was just dropping off a package. And, and, and he comes out of his house, this man with his FedEx uniform on, right? This, this white man come out of his house, hey man, hey, using language, and he and the FedEx driver, uh, uh, the, the, the partner, decided to videotape it. And they videotaped the interaction. And let me tell you something, man, it just, just blew my mind when I seen the video. Do you not know the FedEx driver and the partner, they both got fired be because they videotaped the confrontation? How is that justice? Hey, listen, listen. A youth pastor, y'all, a youth pastor claimed to be kidnapped by black men to avoid admitting that he was in a hotel room soliciting sex. He told his family that he was robbed by two black guys and they took him to the hotel. A Florida mother, she reported that two black men abducted her, uh, 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 her son, autistic son, and, and, and later discovered she, brought, she drowned him. How is that, y'all? Then we know Aubrey, who was chased down and murdered. We saw the video. We saw that. We all saw the video of the young white lady in Central Park who weaponized race by calling the police and say she was being treated by a black man when he asked her to put her dog on a leash, which is what's a part of the ordinance if you got a pet. You saw the video. We saw it. And of course, George Floyd kneeled down. The guy, police got his knee in his neck, suffocating this man. He's saying, I can't breathe. He's calling out for his mother, who has been passed away two years. And I'm going to tell you something. I understand when you call on mother, man, you know something's about to happen. You calling for help. The only one can possibly help you. He said, Mama. But yet, <laughs> they didn't let this man up. And lastly, y'all, uh, <laughs> I'm disturbed by the rioting. I'm disturbed by the burning of the buildings. I'm disturbed, man, that this social, this social destruction is happening. But I understand why, though. Yes, I'm disturbed. Yes, I'm struggling. But I do understand it. I do understand it. 
I understand this, this racial tension is, is at an all-time high in the African Americans, and we're feeling once again that black lives doesn't matter. It's real. We're feeling that thing, right? And, and listen, and, and we still going through a pandemic. God, we need you. We're still in a pandemic. My brothers and sisters, facts remain the same. Yeah. We must continue to walk in faith, in bad faith. We can't let our guards down, although the struggle is real, right? And, and I know I must continue to stand firm and put my, my, my trust in God and not my emotions because my emotions, guys, I am telling you, without faith, they are unreliable and they are unstable. Yes, I've been preaching this thing. At a drop of a dime, our life can change. And we see it even at a drop of a word. But now, like never before, a drop of a video that has gone viral. Enough is enough. Enough is enough. So I'm going to pose some questions on you. And of course, I want you to write them down. Of course, I want you to go back and and, and write down the details. I'm gonna I'm gonna slow walk this today, y'all. I'm gonna take some time to give you something that is that is hard pressed, that is real, for the Christian that who said Jesus. Be my Lord, be my Savior, come into my life, have my life as yours. I am talking to those who accepted Jesus Christ. I am talking to myself. But the question I want to pose on the body of Christ, and I want you as the body of Christ to pose these things on your family's questions and help them to really, to, to, so that they can navigate some of the emotions that they're feeling, man, and some of the things that they're going through. And I am telling you, this is going to be so helpful for you. But this question, I need you to understand and write this down. How do you feel being on the front lines of your faith right now? How do you feel being on the front lines of your faith. In other words, right now I don't get I don't I don't get the luxury to go downtown and and, and do rioting. I don't get the luxury to just act crazy uh, or whatever my impulses feel like in the flesh. I don't get to do that because my faith is still on the front lines right now. Yes. The other question I like for you to consider writing down is: Are you really ready? To follow Jesus Christ through this unforeseen life that we're living today. Do you or are you really ready to follow Jesus Christ through the unforeseen of this life that we are experiencing today? Yeah. Hmm. The other question I want to drop in your spirit. Are you struggling with anything you like to be removed out of your life or character. You know what we talked about? That character, you know, when you're behind scenes and the doors are closed and no one's with you. Is there anything, right, you like, you like, you like, you like removed out of there? Yeah, removed. And I'm going to share one of my eyes with the world today. The other question I want you to think about, do you know your faith was designed to strengthen someone else? Yes, 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 yes. So that's there. Do you understand your faith was designed to strengthen someone else? I hope, man, at the end of this message that your faith would be, you know, strengthened because I had to walk through this myself in order to give you what you're going to receive by God inspiration because they are my realities and they are yours as well. Lastly, do you not know that your faith is going to be tested more often than none? In other words, you know what, man, you just, yeah, you, you, you just, we ain't gonna just get away, man, without this faith tested because Jesus even said, man, to Joe, about Joe, to Satan, have you considered my servant? Didn't he not? Yes, he did. So in other words, our faith is going to be tested. 
And so, since it's going to be touchy, you might as well have some. <laughs> Man, come on, somebody. You might as well have, walk in this thing because it's so important that if your faith is tested and you're going through these trials, man, if you ain't got no faith, guess what? You're going to fall for whatever the struggle is. Now, let me just say some things about me, what I'm feeling personal. I'm just going to let you in on one of my emotions. And I, 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 I'm, I'm not sure... I'm, I'm sure that you can relate to this emotion, okay? And so, you know, over the past, you know, month, the people I've told you I've read stories on and understand what has happened in their lives. And so, you know, the bottom line is I am struggling with anger, then angry. Yeah, then angry, then angry. So this morning, I emailed my congregation and, um, I laid it out to him. I laid it out by way of email where I'm at, you know, what's going on with me, you know, given just the other struggles and what has happened in the past month, weeks, days, 48 hours, I'm struggling with this anger, right? Right? And, 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 and understanding, man, and, and I know that this what I struggle with is this anger that some of it is unrighteous and therefore it's unfruitful and therefore it's ungodly. And, it's, and it goes through my head, right? Sometimes when I'm, I'm playing golf and, I'm a, and, I, and I, I'm, I, I encounter an interaction with a Caucasian person uh, playing and, and I, I say good morning, they just look at me and you know what I mean? And, not cordial, not respectful. I'm just saying to myself, you know, I have to, I have to thank God for an opportunity to pray for that person. But I be pushing, I be struggling, y'all. I be struggling. But I go ahead and do it because I know what's in me, but that flesh, man, want to rise up, man. And I have to remember how you consider my servant Rob. And regardless, man, I be battling through that, man. And sometimes, man, that's why I have my radio and my Christian music going on when I'm playing golf. Because I need my mind regulated constantly. And my wife, the last thing she says to me when I go play golf, have fun. Millions of times she have told me that. I don't come home and tell her my racial tension that I, I endure. Sometimes I text and I tell her how beautiful the course is. I be out there listening to the birds. So when I'm in worship, I, my mind is free from that garbage that I have, that I've endured. But it's real talk, y'all. Yeah, it's real talk. And so, and so what I told my congregation was, you know, I'm reminded most of all, I am a disciple of Jesus Christ of Nazareth first and foremost. Here regards how bad I'm treated. I know who I am and whose I am. And I know that because of the realities of the day, I'm still a disciple of Jesus Christ. And I know that at the end of this time that he chooses that that time will be over for Robert Louis Stevenson. When he says my time is up, I am going to be standing and waiting for him to say, well done, good and faithful servant, irregardless of the racial tension, irregardless of the things of this world, irregardless how the world has treated us over 400 years. I need to hear well done and good and faithful servant. So I need to be who I was called to be and go where he called me to go and not not just be the preacher of the word. I need to be a doer of the word. So I need to understand. I must endure because faith is necessary. We can't get away from it, y'all. I don't get the opportunity to jump out of faith when things are happening. And then jump back in faith on Wednesday morning. The Wednesday night. Jump out of faith when I'm enduring things of hardship on the golf course. But then jump back in faith on Sunday morning. My faith must be a lifestyle and not an event. Come on, y'all. Come on, y'all. Being a Christian, hey, man, ain't easy. And being a pastor definitely ain't easy because my life is under a microscope of the world and definitely a microscope to Jesus Christ of Nazareth. So I shared this 
being angry. And as I've said many times, the Bible is basic instruction before leaving earth. And I can call on my wife to talk to her. I can call on my friends to talk to them. I can call Pastor Cliff, Pastor Willie Morris. I can call Reggie, Reggie Harris. I can call the elders. I can call people that's lined up with me. I can call Pastor Abraham Lincoln Washington. I can call Bishop Scott. I can call Bishop Millett. I got people that's in my corner, that's in my community that I can, I can, I can rest on. I can rest my pain with. And I can tell you, there's nothing like understanding the real resting and where I get the real information from. It is the word of God that sustains me. It's the word of God that gives me the comfort of all comfort. I love the people that's in my corner, but I am telling you, man, I need God to talk to me. And he talks to me. I go and read that Bible. I'll open it up. And here's how he told me to navigate what I'm feeling in the emotions of my anger. He said this in James chapter 1 verse 20. He says, for the anger of a man does not produce the righteousness of God. Good God Almighty. What you say? He said, for the, ang the anger of a man does not produce the righteousness of God. Who am I trying to be right? I am trying to be righteous. The Bible says contentment and righteousness has great gain. So in other words, how I'm going to gain the favor of God if I'm not going to be righteous, therefore I won't be content. So I'll be driven by all of my emotions which are unstable and reliable based on the events that I did not even start. The events that has happened clearly over 400 years. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said, Sunday morning is the most segregated time for Christianity. And we are called to one kingdom, but yet we're divided, even as Christians. Why is that? How can that be okay? How is that fine? Says not true, but it is. My brothers and sisters, listen to me. And so I got tons of God is speaking to me. I love when God is speaking to me. And I and I like the fact that when He's speaking to me, I have to go and allow my heart to render to what He has said. Because it is beneficial. The Bible says the word of God is living and active sharper than any double-edged sword. It divine, it begins to scrape out stuff that ain't that shouldn't be there. That anger that I was feeling wasn't righteous anger. I gotta get to a place to have righteous indignation type of anger. What is that? How is that? How is that even defined? I have my commentary that I want to read this. I want you to hear. I want you to hear this. It is amazing. It helps me. It helped me. And I'm like, okay, God, I can see it. I can see it. I can, it could be well with my soul. And my commentary says, why should we as children of God through faith in Christ learn to control our anger, to slow it down, to keep it in check? For James, the bottom line is this. Anger does not work. Practically speaking, anger is a ineffective tool for contributing to the righteousness of God. Letting anger fly may be a great tool for getting our own way. The world tells us that anger can be manipulated or intimidate those around us. Anger gives us the feeling that we are in control of the people in our lives, even making ourselves feel better for a few moments. But even from a non-spiritual perspective, this comes at a high price. When we lose our integrity, the trust of others, and our self-controls when we live by anger. Is that not true? Yeah. All those facts I told you are real. But going downtown and looting, lottering and breaking down and busting up, and just, that, that is not right. There's nothing right about that action but we and I must uh, we must understand what spirit is in operation the spirit of anger is in operation not the spirit of righteous indignation 
The Bible says, be angry, but sin not. You can, pro you can protest at being angry at what the injustice, police brutality, 400 years of slavery. Hey, man, we back on the front lines. Do black lives really matter? Yes, be angry, but sin not. Then he goes on and says, James' teachings here reveals a huge idea. We were created for far more than simply getting the super, uh, superficial things out of life. Part of our purpose as believers, watch this, brothers and sisters, is to be used by God to help contribute his righteousness. Come on, man. I am telling my brothers and sisters, listen to me. If you know people personally are going down and went down and did some things that was unrighteous, man, minister to them in love. Help them to understand. I understand anger. I understand what you're feeling. But the truth of the matter, there's ways that you can navigate the very thing that you're feeling. And you start by being in the word of God. And let me help you to see this. Let me help you to, let me help you to condition your heart. Let me help you massage your heart so that, man, you can have a place to vent. But you won't vent in action that will cause lawful and harmful action. Not only the purpose as believers, it's also to help accomplish his purpose in the world. We as the body of Christ, we, we are to stand on this righteousness. Yeah, yeah. So, so then he goes on. James, he distinguished between human anger or the anger of man and pres presumably God's anger. He says everything God feels and expresses is righteous, including his anger. Human anger, by contrast, is nearly always an expression of human selfishness, fear, or desire to control things around us. But those who trust the Father to be in control, to provide what he said he would provide, to bring justice when the time is right, can't afford to let go of what God has promised. But some may say, Pastor Rob, maybe you're not sensitive to the racial tension in America. And I say to you, oh yes, I am. I've said it earlier, go back and listen to the recording. It's the reason why I feel the way I feel. But I know that I cannot respond off of my impulses. But my truth of the world cannot be greater than my truth in the word. Yes. And my brothers and sisters, I am just telling you that even, even in this, we are still in a pandemic. There are people out there without masks on. They, they are congregating together. They, they don't realize the enemy is at work within them. Even because Righteous indignation will still cause you to have a mind that will be at least with some constraint and some discipline. Because when we are out of righteous indignation, we become into our own righteousness. And then therefore we get to say why I feel the way I feel and why I act the way I act. And the truth of the matter is I get it. But there's a way that may seem right to a man. But God has the way. He is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. He is the apple. He's the omega. He's the beginning and the end. He knows all things. This is, this is not surprising to God. This is our reality. And my brothers and sisters, I am telling you, you are not alone. I thank God that we are not alone. 
And if you're feeling your anger and this thing that is happening, there's a word for you right now in the Bible, man. See, I gave you the word that God was helping me with. Now, I'm going to give you a word in an illustration that's going to blow your mind. I want you to write this down. Hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share with a person that's in the Bible that's going to just, just, and you probably you read it a hundred times, but you never looked at it in this light. In fact, this person, all they were doing was standing up for their friend who was treated unjustly, who was accused for something he'd never done. And was treated in a way that he shouldn't have been treated. And his friend stood up on his behalf. There's people right now standing up on the behalf of George Floyd's family. And I'm talking about they doing it in the right way, a civil way. Or, or protesting. They First Amendment right. They out there doing what they're supposed to be doing. I get it. But there's other people on the sidelines are just waiting to do other things that they shouldn't be doing. I get that too. But I am telling you, we, 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 there's a right way and a wrong way to stand for justice. This man <laughs> stood for justice the same way we see some of the people in America, all, all these states, trying to stand for justice. Let's, let me tell you what happened. First of all, I realize that God is doing something in all of us. Okay? He's doing something in all of us. Not just, not just me, but he's doing something in all of us. And what he's doing, man, he's allowing his will to be done in our lives. And, and I told some people, oh, man, Pastor, you, you, you struggle to anger. Listen, hey, listen, don't judge me. I am telling you, man, I know what I'm asking God to help me with. Okay? Now, in order to overcome some of those character things that we struggle with, right, guess what got to happen? You got to get sifted. Oh, you heard what I just said. You got to get sifted. See, the Bible says in Luke 22, verse 31 and 30, 32, it says, Jesus said, hmm, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you all as wheat. But I pray for you, Simon, that your faith will may not fail. He says, and when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. Okay, okay. Now, you got to understand, sifted is, a defined, is defined as a pass-through or sorting device like a screen to sort, right? To separate or careful examine. So think about a gold miner. What they do, they use a gold miner pan. What they do, to strain the gold from the sand. And so the sand will fall out when they keep just sifting around the sand will fall out and the gold will be on top. Or as a chef, what he right? God is doing some stuff. God is sifting, right? He's sifting old Pastor Rob. He's sifting me with some of these events. He's sifting me so that, guess what? All the impurities can fall out of me. So the best of me can be laid to rest so that I can be used effectively. That's what God is doing. He's sifting us. So we got to even embrace the sifting time. You can't, we and I, you know, we can't rely on our emotions, man, when we're feeling hurt. You know, especially when they become ungodly because they become unstable. So that's a process. And this person, I'm talking about Simon Peter. Man, I'm talking about, man, listen, Simon had no idea. Listen to the scripture, man. He had no idea that his life was about to change again at a drop of a word. At a drop of the event. Our lives is changing right now at a drop of a word. At a drop of these events that has happened over 400 years. We're still being sifted, y'all. We're still being sifted. So here it is. Jesus gave Satan rain. But he also prayed for Simon. That his faith did not fail him. And I'm telling you, man, Simon's life began to change. And he began to go through the process. And let me tell you, this sifting process happened at a, at a critical season, at a critical time, at a critical situation, when at a, even at the Mount Olive, when Jesus was being arrested by the palace guard, Simon, or Simon Peter, what he did was to prevent the arrest, the Bible says in John 18, 10, he says, he drew his sword and cut off the ear. Of one of the high priest servants. Oh God. See. 
even through his system, his sifting season, <laughs> man. Simon had some anger in him, y'all. Listen, Simon, he, didn't, he wasn't going to let Jesus get arrested. He cuts off the ear. Now, he had watched Jesus do a lot of things. Listen, he's the rock. He's been giving the keys to the kingdom. This man cuts off the ear of the high priest's servant. Something like what our, what our emotions go through, what we're feeling, and some of the conversations we may, what we may be having that relates to racism, or some of the things that you may be feeling inside of you. Are you cutting off the ear of righteousness? Yeah, man, I was like, oh, I'm convicted, Jesus. Oh, my God. Yeah. Jesus said, put that away. <laughs> man. Hey, this is not the type of party we're going to have today. I got to go do something. Although Simon felt, he, he felt, that you arrest Jesus? My friend? That ain't going to happen. What Jesus did, picked up, they picked up the ear and he healed that ear. Jesus is looking to heal this land. We just got to let this thing play out. He just, we, we can't be God, but we can be godly. The other thing that happened, man, in his sifting period, hey, listen, he got he 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 fell out of place, man. And then you know what? He seen Jesus get carried off. They're walking, and then he was caught off guard, not by a soldier, by by but by a young lady who who says, "Hey, hey, hey, hey!" In John eighteen seventeen, he says, "Are you the one? <clears throat> are you the one of this man's disciples too?" Hey, hey, I'm calling you out. You was with him. Oh, no, Peter asked, oh, 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 no, he replied, I am not. In his sifting time, he lying. Come on, y'all. <laughs> he lying in his sifting time. I understand that, too. I've lied. You've lied. God trying to get that out of us. Yeah. He denied. Another part. Time is sifting time. The Bible says in John 18, 25, he says, meanwhile, Simon Peter was still standing there warming himself because it was cold, cold outside. So they asked, aren't you one of the disciples too? Aren't you? He did not say, I am not. Sifting. Sifting. It's happening. It's happening to America. Sifting. Lastly, one of the high priest's servants questioned him strongly, suspiciously, in John 18, 26, it says, one of the high priest's servants, a relative of the man who ear Peter cut off, challenging him, did not see you with him in the garden. <laughs> man, come on. It's an eyewitness that seen this man get his ear cut off. They family. Now, this was the time because he'd been sifted. For him to come clean. How much impurities had to go through the sifter? He had opportunity to stand, but he did not stand. In fact, he did it again. He denied him. And the rooster began to crow. My brothers and sisters, Peter was sifted. There's a lot that's happening right now in America. There's not, there's a lot happening right now. We've been sifted. We've been sifted for so long. Don't you know God knows about the 400 years of slavery? 400 years of, of, of injustice and the racism? God knows. What is he trying to do? He's trying to get all the impurities out of us. That's what he's trying to do. And I'm telling you, it doesn't feel good. But I know that if, if we act in an ungodly way and deny Deny that who we are and whose we are, we are no different than Peter. Peter was fighting for justice. It was unjust and unreal, ungodly, man, to even grab, to, 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 to even want to arrest Jesus. Jesus had not sinned. But the scripture tells us he, he took up our iniquities and our infirmities. It was prophesied before he was even born or let, uh, before he came down from heaven to earth or even born that he must endure these things. 
So the Bible reminds Pastor Rob that, Rob, you better remember this. Consider a pure joy when facing trials of many kinds because the testing of your faith develop perseverance. So go through what you got to go through, son. I am building your faith up. I'm doing it for a reason. So that you can have righteous indignation. My brothers and sisters, now we can't blame old Peter. We can't judge Peter. But the Bible also says that Jesus prayed for Peter, that his faith might not fail him. And he told him, says, he said, and when you have, he said, and when you have returned to me, and then strengthen your brothers. So God gives us an opportunity right now to repent. I said, God, I thank you. I repent. I'm not going to get involved in some of these some of these unrighteous conversations about the truth of the reality but I need to get involved in some righteous conversation of the speaking the truth of the word to bring comfort because the more we involved ourselves in conversation that is real for us but they don't have truth in God's word that's aligned with it, it just sets people off in a domino effect and brings fear for those. Y'all say, man, I, I know you're quiet out there. I'm just telling you all what's real. And so listen, listen, listen. There are benefits of being sifted, right? And the benefits is a good thing, right? Here's the reason why. Because the benefit of being sifted is like this. Remember, sift is not only eliminates clumps in a foreign object, it also aerates the flour, making it lightly and fluffy for those who like baking good cakes. This benefits the baking in two ways. The flour evenly absorbs moisture and ingredients throughout and result in a more and result in a process. This process of spiritual sifting helps create a new character within the person. What it does, it tears away all old perspective and put fresh fruit in its place. Let me tell you something. Before I became a Christian, I ain't tell I, I, I kid you not, I hate white people. Yep. I would not be engaged with a white person. It's true. And God started doing some stuff over 25 years ago. And man, let me tell you, before I know it, Man, I, I became a Christian, started studying the Bible, and then I moved in Oak Park. I wound up having white roommates. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. What you say, Pastor Rob, I am telling you. That's true. Yes, sir. I had I had roommates. We man, we got us an apartment together, and one of my white roommates was Tom Zim, a powerful man of God. And I'm talking about God used his character to refine me. I didn't have a car. He used to take me to work and pick me up every day. And let me tell you how I love this man so much. He, he, his character was different from mine because I, you know, I wasn't a coarse joking kind of guy. He was, and I'm thinking, what is wrong with this guy? He must want me to fight him. <laughs> Come on, somebody. I had to learn culture. And one of my closest friends on the face of this earth, his name is David Prost. Him and my brother, white brother, I mean, we, we have prayed, cried, been on, been on vacations together, prayed, cried, and all kind of stuff together. I'm telling you what, what God would do in the sifting process. All eight. Hey, people think, well, you don't know what you don't know. All policemen's not bad. I got family, relatives that's a part of the police force. I baptized one of the commanders of the Oak Park Police Force. I got folks that I play golf with are policemen that I love dearly and they respectful. Just like all black people ain't mad. <laughs> Come on, somebody. We can't stereotype the world. The symptom process helped us to grow in character. And I'm telling you, what he does was it, it, he get rid of some of your formal habits. And I'll never forget, man, when I told some of my family my roommate was white, they said, man, you must be going to a cult kind of church. What's wrong with you? You done lost your mind, man. How the heck you got a white man in your house? Ain't you scared he's going to kill you? 
I am telling y'all, 24 years ago, people told me that stuff. They didn't know what they didn't know, y'all. And what God do? He got me packed. Oh, amazing. God is amazing, man. I am pastoring a church that was founded upon racial reconciliation. One of my, one of my mentors before he died going to be with the Lord was Glenn K. Ryan, white man who stayed in the gap with me. Come on, man. I'm trying to tell y'all, boy. What sifting does. Let God finish doing the sifting parts, sir. Process in our lives. Get the impurities out of it. Yes, there are things we're going to keep growing in. But let God finish doing what he does. Because he's good at it. Let me tell you some of the things that I know the sifting process I benefited from. I benefit because it has helped build my faith. It, is, it has helped build new character within me. It has removed some of my old perspective. It has given me truth and values. It removed some of the old tendencies I had about white folks. It refined it me. It, it revealed my weaknesses. It, it had me to depend on God and God alone. Didn't I tell y'all, man, I had to go to God's word so that he can redeem me. So in my anger, I can have righteous indignation. Not the kind that's going to pull down or tear down and be unfruitful, but the kind that's going to build up and be fruitful, but yet last on the word of God. And I'll take it all to God in prayer. We got the most amazing tool that's so available for the word of God, for the, for the people of this world. It is prayer. It is prayer. So why is so significant to an imperative to be sifted so that we don't walk away from my faith? Why is that? Because Jeremiah 29, 11 says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. Here's the reason why. Because God don't want his people to become stagnant. He don't want us to be collaborating in things that we have no business collaborating in. Such as going downtown and looting. Such as tearing up stuff. Stuff of being socially destructive. Stuff of just tearing stuff down for the sake of because I'm mad. Prayer changes things. God telling us to stop talking about things we ain't, that's not going to build people up. Talk about things that's going to manifest the word in them. Therefore, they'll have, therefore they'll have a new life that they may set their mind on God, who is the author and perfecter of their faith. Somebody say, hey, man. So what are some of the things God's sifting us in? Some of the things of our character to bring his people to alignment with him. He is sifting us out of all the things that is hindering us from moving and doing his purpose. God is, he's removing all the impurities from our heart and, 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 and so that we can be repositioned. So that we can turn back and strengthen our brethren. What else is he doing? He's removing all the, the old habits and the old mindset. Like my mindset ain't like it was 26 years ago. That relates to Caucasian people. What is he doing? He's asking us to surrender it all on the threshing floor. Because he's sifting us. So the question that I, I wrote just the other day in my heart, I just wrote this down. It says, Rob, are you going to run from the sifter? Are you going to run from it or are you going to, or you going to yield to it? Because I'm going to be shaking up, bouncing around and going through it. You going to be shaking up, bouncing around and going through it. Are you going to run away from the sifter? Because the sifting process, when it's over with, it's going to show you that you shine like gold in the name of Jesus. Jesus didn't say to Peter, and he definitely ain't going to say to us, I won't let this happen to you. 
We will be sifted. Either you like it or not. It's going to happen. But you can have, you can be content in this. But I have prayed for you that your faith would not fail. That's what Jesus said. He said that. He said, and when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. In other words, when you overcome and when you repent, turn back. Come on now, you're coming back to me. Because we cannot, you know, we, we cannot do this without God. We need God to do this. And, and then guess what? Because we all sin and fall short of God's glory. God did not let Peter stay out there. And I thank God did not let me stay out there neither. And God has not let you stay out there neither. You ought to say amen. God is saying to you, come on, girl. Come on, sister. Come on, come on. Come on, young man. Come on, come on, teenager. Come on, y'all come on back in here. Yeah, you done, you done lost sight of things. Yeah, you mad. Yeah, you done been cussing. You been fussing. I get that. No problem. You angry. You didn't know how to deal with your anger, but I got something for you. Come on in here. I, all you got to do is say, God, I'm sorry. I repent right now because the blood of the lamb has already died for you. You ain't dying no more. He's already, you've been justified by faith through faith. I am telling you, his blood still works. The blood of God is something else. I am telling you, it covers all your iniquities. And God doesn't treat us as our sin deserves. And all we got to do is say, I am sorry and I repent in the name of Jesus. And God will do the rest. If you've been judging people, stop judging them. It's not our place to judge them. We got a righteous judge. We have to pray for the people. Somebody say, hey, Amen. We got to pray. We got to pray. And when Peter was reinstated, he said, Jesus said to him, well, feed my sheep. I repented. God told me, now feed my sheep. I'm going to give you a sermon to give them to my people because you repented. Go and feed them this morning, pastor. Feed them because they need to eat right now. They need to have comfort right now. They need to draw closer to you right now. They need to be able to navigate what they're going through in their emotions right now. Feed the people right now, son. Yes, Lord. So my brothers and sisters, as I wind up to close us out, I want to tell you something about what Dr. Martin Luther King said. He said, let me say, as I've always said, I will continue to say, that riots are socially destructive and self-defeating. But in the final analysis, a riot is the, the language of the unheard. And what is in America has failed to hear. It has failed to hear that the plight of the Negro poor has worsened over the last few years. It has failed to hear that the promises of freedom and justice have not been met. And it has failed to hear that the large segment of white society are more concerned about tranquility and the status quo than about justice, equality, and, and humanity. And, 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 uh, humanity. And so, in a real sense of our nation's summers of riots, are caused by a nation's winters of delay. And as long as American postpone justice, we stand in the position of having these reoccurrences of violence and riots over and over again. And he said this in 1967. And now we are in, guess what? June 20. 20. Huh. Is y'all with me out there this morning? This is real, my brothers and sisters. This is already been, this ain't new, there ain't nothing new under the sun. The question is, how do we respond as Christians? Now, how do you feel currently that you are now in the sifting process? Are you really ready to follow Jesus through the front, through the unforeseen of this sifting process? Are you ready to, the things that you are struggling with that you won't remove, do you now want it to re, be removed and shaken out of you through this sifting process? 
Do you not know that faith, where your faith was designed to strengthen someone else? Because now, God, you have repented. Now you have to go and get somebody else and strengthen your brothers, your sisters, your cousins, your nieces, your aunts, your co-workers. Now you understand that your faith will always be tested because you are in the sifting process. My brothers and sisters, keep the faith. Stand on Jesus. Because the Bible says, now to him is able to do immeasurably more than we can ask or imagine. According to his power that's in us. To him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations. Amen, amen, amen. God be with us. We thank you for an opportunity to go before your throne this morning. Father, I thank you, God, for mending my heart where the pains of anger rested and resided. But God, I thank you that the word of God has pushed that to a place of ignorant, ignorant right, in righteous nation. To be angry, but sin not. I pray for my brothers and sisters, all under the sound of my voice, and all who yet to hear this recording. May you be lifted up and highly exalted for your glory. In Jesus' name, that God's people say amen. Guys, Bridget and I and Blake, we love y'all so much. Thank you for allowing this time to go. God blessings. I love you.